you very much for letting me come today. Well, it's always a pleasure. Um, yeah. yeah, it has been too long. I was thinking um, the last time I came to the studio on a studio visit was almost a year ago. It was well, almost it that long. Yeah, it could be. I think August yeah. last year. Yeah. Um, so it's really lovely to be here. Yeah. Um, and I thought it'd be really nice um, to talk about the history of you being in the studio. Yes. Well. Um, I had a studio before in um, the old street area, EC1, and it was beautiful. It was the top floor of a warehouse, which was pretty impractical. Mm -hmm. It was all that when I was making light aluminium painted sculptures. But when I started to get into more bulky, heavier stuff, it was not the place to be. Plus, it was quite difficult to get lorries in there and transport. So I put the word out to a friend and who lives near here so he said come and see a, a studio which you might like i said if it's south london you can forget it i don't go to south london he said never mind that just come and have a look and i had a look and i thought yes he's right it's perfect it was pretty derelict it had been a plumber's warehouse and it's an old church hall but why why i like it apart from it's quiet and it's peaceful and good size. Its geometry is quite specific. It's square, 18 meter by 18 meter. It's got a triangular ceiling and it's supported, the ceiling's, the roof's supported on four semicircular steel arches, which you might have a look at later. Love so it's very sympathetic to my absolutely uh, work. my work, my geometric sort of work. Yeah, yeah. And um, we sh we closed all the windows except blocked them in except for three, and opened a big skylight. So it has fantastic light. And um, yes, yeah, that was in nineteen ninety one. I can ask you when that was nineteen ninety one. Mm. Yeah. And did you put these huge glass? Doors in. The doors okay. came in much later. Yeah. Um, the big space is impossible to heat, so I treated in depths of the winter as like almost like an outdoor sculpture park. Yeah. Uh, it's not so bad the rest of the year, it's perfect really. About like two months of the year, three months of the year, it's pretty good chilly. So this area is heated, and the glass windows allow you to be in here and not be cut off from the main space. Exactly, it's lovely to have that as a backdrop. When we have our conversations, we can sort of sit here and plan what yeah, we're doing yeah, together, and there exactly. you've got the, the work to talking. reference it. Yeah. Exactly, um, and what's lovely is that every time I come here, it changes. Well, there's certain work that stays here, yeah. um, such as um, this work here, which is one of your earliest works. Um, oh, you, the, the hanging piece, the yeah, spike. The spike, that's it. Yeah, that um, was. Um, that was made in 1970, I think, it could be 71, 70, 71. And it's um, tapered. Uh, so the thinnest diameter aluminium tube is the longest and it gradually telescopes to the, the widest circumference being the shortest in length. And I wanted, to, I made it because I wanted a, a still point in my room, really, it was made as a piece which I want to live with. There, it's an addition of two, um, but I, I just needed something which would remind me that there's a sense of calmness in, as possible. So these uh, a hanging plumb line yeah. is drawn to the centre of the earth. So apart from just the stillness within the room, mm -hmm. it also takes the mind to how we exist on the on the earth on the globe. And it had a, um, a revival, let's put it that way, in about the year 2000. Salisbury Cathedral was doing a, an exhibition of sculpture. And I, was, I put a big quartet piece on the close, on the green outside the cathedral. And they said, would you like to make a piece for indoors? And I said, no, I don't think it would be, I can't really, I'm not very fond of sculpture in churches. They always seem to be a bit extraneous. And, Anyway, they said, well, have a think about it. And I did spend the day at the cathedral, and, which I love, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, and there was a point when, when I was listening to a guide describing to some visitors, if you lifted a, a stone slab in the floor, 
you could you would come across water because Salisbury Cathedral is practically floating. Oh, right. It's built on reeds on a very wet bit of land. Mm -hmm. You'd see a, um, an area of water, and that made me think of the horizontality of water. And then I thought about the verticality of the spire, mm -hmm. and I thought of this piece. Yeah. I thought if if I made this piece on a large scale, which I did, fifty feet long, wow. it could hang directly beneath the spire. Mm -hmm. And we found a trap door in the ceiling where the crossing of the aisle with the nave and you could climb up into the roof and you could look down and there was a, a winch mm -hmm. and we winched this the 50 foot version so it hung directly under the spire mm -hmm. so when you were outside coming to the first thing you see coming to Salisbury from London yeah. is the spire set yeah. amongst the landscape so when you're inside you've got a memory of the spire going up and when you're outside you had a memory of the if it's opposite hanging beneath the spire inside. Gosh, amazing. Yeah, it's quite an interesting idea. Well, quite an architectural feat as well to, yeah. to get that. Yeah. Is that something that you had to liaise with? And do you have to liaise with architects a lot or with um, structural uh, engineers with some of your work? Sometimes, but um, not with this one. The only thing mm -hmm. I did with this one was uh, make references to one of the. Each column of the cathedral is surrounded by smaller columns. Mm -hmm. So I use the small the down of the smaller column yeah. to be the width of the biggest section of the 50 foot one. Yeah. So it had some reference to the locale. It didn't stay there, unfortunately. It stayed there for six months or whatever, I can't yeah. remember. And now it's in, in pieces because it's all screwed together, each part yeah. screwed, right. like, like sort of telescope. Yeah. Yeah. So it's in the, stored in the studio here, yeah. okay. which is a bit of a shame. But, um, Anyway. Wow, sounds like it had a... That's, that's back, yeah. Yeah, amazing. It's, just, it's had an outing in New York recently, it's got shown over there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, wonderful to see. I, I always love seeing it. I don't know, it is very centering, this piece in the company. Yeah, it feels yeah. like, um, what was the date of it originally then? Was it? I think 1970. Right, so yeah, exactly. So one of your earlier works. Early work, yeah. And it's a really kind of strong statement. And yeah. it sort of grounds, it's almost, for me, feels like this is the statement, this is like Nigel's statement. Of calm, like you say, yeah. and it informs the rest of your body of work. Yeah. Um, and that calmness does come through your work. I mean, that's something that really is important. Well, that's um, something that's important to me that the work has a, a stillness and a calmness and a meditative quality. Um, it's also a strength. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, I hope so, yeah. yeah. Mm. But it's a, it's, a, it, it's a slow burn, I think, my work, you know. You, it doesn't hit you straight away, I'm always. Some people get it. I disagree, but um, yeah. I think, yeah, I think it, it speaks very powerfully and very strongly um, and very calmly. I think that's what's attractive right. about yeah. it. And, and because, there's, just personally speaking, because of the, the forms being so kind of eternal, you know, they have that sort of calmness, you know, and the natural geometries that we've talked about. I mean, yeah. your work's being looked at by the Mathematical Institute. Yeah. in Cambridge, hasn't yeah. it, for having these amazing kind of internal rhythms which... Well this was a funny thing, yeah. when they approached me, it was the Isaac Newton Institute in yeah. Cambridge. They, they said, you, your work is quite mathematical, and I kind of was rather resistant to that idea. Not that I, I was rather flattered, mm -hmm. especially somebody who took O-level maths twice and <laughs> got it the second time. I said, well I do, I, I don't... All I do is a few sums, you know, that's my maths. Yeah. But I mean, there is a bit more to it than that. Sure. It wasn't really false modesty, but I don't really think of the work as mathematical. But of course it is, you know, I mean, the, the, one has to know a little bit about geometry anyway. And, and I suppose physics, but my physics is a sort of innate physics of how the piece will operate from weights and counter, counterbalancing and so forth. But yes, I did a show of smaller sculpture at um, Isaac Newton, and I think it it, it it seemed to interest the mathematicians there a lot. I had a I did a seminar, you were there, you were there um, with a Canadian woman um, who was a a mathematician, and I thought, gosh, this is going to be a, a tough act, but it actually worked quite well. It's yeah. brilliant, and she was talking about the natural forms in genetics. And yeah, that's right. Enjoying the shapes and how yeah. some of what was fascinating was how some of the forms that you innately have um, envisaged and uh, brought to fruition through your work are also it's sort of similarities with 
uh, mathematical web genetics where you have to think of the mathematical formula if I'm right in remembering and you have to take a sort of you sometimes have to draw what your theory is before you can actually write the write the algebra or the code. I did not do that. Good, you're right. That's right. That's what she was saying, and so as you can see, the way you've drawn it sort of similarities with some of these genetic codings, which yeah. is really fascinating. Yeah. So, especially when you consider that you, if I'm writing, you know, saying you know your work is is based in nature and your understanding of the natural world. Perhaps it's from a visual point of view, yeah. you know, thinking yeah. about the landscape, yeah. but it's even more innate than that. There's somehow a connection to our very essences and beings, which perhaps, you know, it, it is something that is difficult, where it takes like an expert in genetics to kind of, you know, so that it really is that there's an innate sort of nature to, to your yeah. work. Well, all those things I'm very happy about, and a lot of them have come about, I mean, how, I don't know, not through research mm -hmm. in that sense, but I suppose you you learn a great deal by looking at nature and making drawings, which I've done all my life. A lifetime of studying it, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And observing and observation. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I was interested in what you said about your innate physics as well, and trial and error. So talk me through how that works. Um, well, I suppose it, the, the basis of that is that I, I'm, I'm very um, sort of insistent to myself, if, nobody else, that the works, the sculptures I make, should be self-supporting, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, some sculptors make quite fascinating works that sort of come out of the ground at a weird angle, and I'm only supported by that, mm -hmm. but, but they need a great deal of substructure to support them. That sort of sculpture is dramatic and wonderful, but it's not what I want to make. I want to make a piece that sort of sits, you know, and it is, is supporting. I, having talked about a piece that's suspended from the ceiling, <laughs> it kind of goes against my, yeah. my principles, but most of the time yeah, the sure. work... And, and so in order to do that, you either have to get a structural engineer, especially when you're working on a big scale, to say whether it's going to balance or not, or you use your own instinct, mm -hmm. and through maquettes and so forth, you find what really works, what will be stable. Mm -hmm. um, and when it grows to a big size, of course, then you, if it goes into a public place, you have to be, you run it past the engineers, structural engineers to get clearance for it. So it, it gets sort of... It um, does get the seal of approval. It gets the seal of approval, but you come up with the idea and then someone yeah. else will say, well done, Michael. Yeah, that's usually. That's actually sound. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I and I also thought it would be quite interesting to talk about your works on paper. Oh, yes. Um, and leading off from that, actually, your works on canvas, which is something oh, new. Oh, yes. Um, I've not seen works on canvas before, but you, you told me that it's something that you have done, to, but not for 10 years. It's something that you've started to do since lockdown. Yeah, yeah. Um, I suppose it's about 10 years ago. I did a series, which when I was, it might be more than 10 years, when time flies, I think it might be 15 years. I made a series of, um, I was doing the circle yeah. works, and I decided to do a whole group, and it couldn't have been more than 10, I suppose, on canvas. And uh, they were shown in Stockholm. Um, and then I, what, I, what appealed to me was that they didn't need to be framed, glazed. You know, like a, a painting doesn't have to be glazed. You stick it on the wall and dust it occasionally. It's not what the painters do. If only life was so easy for us sculptors. Uh, I'm sure sculptures need dusting, don't they? Yeah, no, they fill the dust. Um, Anyway, my late wife, Manage, Yadagar, who was shown with you, yeah. knew her, did you? No, no I didn't know her. Though. But you know her work very her well, you, you've um, dealt with it a lot. Well, thank you. Uh, when she died, she left quite a few canvases. And I thought, shame to waste them. And I remember that I'd made works on canvas. Yeah. So at the lockdown, I thought, I'm going to use these. and I, I think I'm, I haven't made that many, a dozen canvases. And, I, and for the same reason, I love it, because you don't need to put glaze them, so the charcoal, the blackness of the charcoal is not reflecting back at you, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but the drawings are a separate, quite a separate activity to my sculptures. They're related, they have the same sort of um, themes and interests, obviously. But I... Having talked a little bit earlier about gravity and all the sort of problems that it gives us, it's wonderfully re re relaxing to make works on paper where you don't have to worry about 
things falling down. <laughs> you can draw something top left hand corner and it stays there right. immediately, or even top right hand corner. Yeah. Either way, it seems to work. So you can put things wherever you want and it's refreshing and it's so liberating. So I do a period of maybe a few weeks making drawings. So as much as a few weeks, so you'll really have a break with the sculpture. Yeah. So it's not, that's one thing I was going to ask actually. So it's not like actually today I just, I'd like just to make a drawing. It is a sort of, you have a whole period of time when you're making I, a body. I tend to, I tend to make, yeah. you know, work on sculptures and then think I need a break. And, yeah. And, and during the time I'm working on the sculptures, I tend to, as you know, carry these little notebooks. Yeah. And in here, there'll be ideas. I mean, quite literally, I, I have it by my, my bed at night, and I think it's nearly every night's the last thing I look at in, at night, and nearly the first thing in the morning. Mm -hmm. So I, I, um, I make little ideas, which could be drawing or sculpture, and sometimes one sort of starts as a possible drawing for a sculpture, and it ends up as a, a try. And when you look back on your sort of sketchbooks, and just really fascinating to think, do you sort of have a, well, they're all sort of very productive, obviously, but do you think, gosh, that was really interesting, because I, you know, do you, are you able to have the perspective on what you were doing at what time? Do yeah. you think, gosh, that was a really productive period? Yeah. Or, you know, what was I thinking then? Or that was amazing, because I introduced this colour idea. Yeah. Or, you know, uh, and, and, um, certain times you you think, God, there's so many ideas at that time I only did develop one of them. Right. It seems such a shame that one couldn't have developed several of those ideas that came flooding in before you moved on to the next one. And you don't you're not tempted to go back and think, well actually or, or are you inspired by your past work sometimes to think okay, Sometimes, to sometimes, but if, if if too much time is elapsed, I don't find you it. You just pass it and think, okay. Yeah, just that, yeah, that was a good time. That was good and it helped me get to there. Yeah, exactly. But um, I mean, if it's like last year's notebook, those ideas will probably still be quite relevant. So I'm sure. not, my, my mind. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, and then I was going to talk to you, thinking about being here in your studio, surrounded by all the larger scale work, but all these wonderful maquettes. So these are all again. These are like ideas that yeah. you've developed out of your. They're a little bit. Yeah, the next stage. Yeah, the next the stage exactly. Yeah. So the, yeah. the maquettes are sort of not all made into larger scale sculpture. No, and some of them are small sculptures rather Absolutely. than maquettes. Exactly. I always make that point because you know sometimes I like now I think when it, having been doing quite a lot of drawings I feel like making a sculpture and I've got an idea for a small. You know, and it will exist as a small sculpture in yeah. its own right and not something that will be scaled up because you feel like... I'm not saying I won't scale it up, sure. but it'll start life not as a maquette but as a small sculpture. That's it. But yeah. sometimes you look at those and you think, yeah, I can't resist it. Let's see what happens if you yeah. expand that a bit. Yeah. yeah. And a bit like um, we were talking about colour earlier and I was asking you when we weren't recording about, you know, at what point do you know what colour you're going to do something in your drawings and you've just shown us it's sort of at the point of inception. Mm. The same with materials, at what point do you think, right, I want this to be bronze or aluminium? That, you know, that's a little bit more open. Okay. But sometimes that's not decided until the very last minute. Yeah. When I talk to Andy, who's my fabricator. Okay. It, it, at the moment he's making a small version of the piece called Ghost. Yeah. A little bronze. And I was going to make it in core 10, then last minute I changed it to bronze, I mean, yeah. a bit like the colour, yeah. for a rather capricious reason, I don't know quite why, but yeah. it's going to be a little bronze, I think it'll be quite a nice piece. Yeah. It's very simple, and yeah. it's almost like an absence, you know, it has, a, has this elliptical space held mm -hmm. between, a, with a circular sort of form, mm -hmm. um, it's like a sort of... Um, Absence has always been quite interesting, a void, you know. Yeah. Um, well, I think, you know, it is, it is the empty spaces which are contained by these very strong geometrical forms, which, you know, I think is very compelling. And what makes your work, um, in a way, so nice to be around, you know, because there's this kind of calmness and you don't feel shut in by it, mm. whether it's mm. large scale in a garden or whether it's mm. a maquette like this, which you, I mean, letting the air breathe through it is quite mm. important, isn't it? Yeah. You can be able to see through the well, Absolutely. I always think of my work as yeah. sort of transparent. Yeah. You know, you can see through them. And what, what is also important about that transparency is that the work therefore borrows the space around. 
Right. You know, you see through and you see, if it's outdoors, you see part of the landscape that can, becomes part of it. Yeah. Or if it's indoors, you see elements of the interior space that therefore, you know, integrate with the piece. Yeah. It's a bit like when I first went to Japan, I was very interested in um, Japanese dry gardens, you know, mm -hmm. sand and gravel gardens. And, and I was rather shocked when I came across one or two of them that were the size of a, I don't know, a, a carpet. Tiny, tiny little perfect sand gardens. And, and I was rather amazed. I, you know, you tend to think of gardens as being a bit more spacious. Mm -hmm. But then I realised that beyond the garden and seeing in the garden beyond it would be a mountain or a hill, something which just by the design of that small garden incorporated that distant view. So that was small in its actual di dimensions. It was much larger in terms of its um, what it encompassed. Yeah. And I was thinking sort of that as borrowing, borrowing space. Yeah. You know, whereas a painting tends to stop at its border. Yeah. Usually. Yeah. Whereas a sculpture tends to sort of move, move out and allow it to be. So everywhere you put a sculpture, it becomes unique. Whereas everywhere you put a painting, pretty much it's the same painting. Yeah. You might see different things each time you look at something oh, yeah, or right. appreciate yeah. it in a different way, but. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. A sculpture is always going to have a multitude of yeah. angles and that different ways and yeah. you know, viewpoints to enjoy it. And like you say, the settings are going to make a huge difference. Yeah, yeah that's an interesting thought about borrowing space. Mm -hmm. And the shadow we were talking about earlier as well is also quite important in your work. And the, yeah. kind of the shadows that the sculpture casts yeah. around it as well. That's yeah. Something that yeah, it is. Um, which is why when I moved to the studio and I put the skylight in, uh, everybody said, oh, you put it on the wrong roof. It should be on the north side. Mm -hmm. So the light doesn't change. I said, well, that's exactly the opposite of what I want. I want the light to change. Yeah. So I got it on the south face so that when the sun comes in uh, during the course of the day, the light moves around, the shadows change, and that's fascinating. Yeah. Well, it's wonderful to come here, Nigel, and to see um, the work and to see you, um, but it's always, I, I was sort of saying this earlier, but it's always wonderful to see how it changes and how um, amazing you are with all your new ideas and to see to see the changes and the work comes in and it goes out. Oh, thank you. It's, it's just really such a treat. Thank so, you. Well, thank you for talking to well, us. Well, it's today. been a pleasure. Come again. Mm -hmm. soon.